Hello, LVC. For those of you who are not part of Lavington Vineyard Church, my name is Jeremy Cook, and I serve as one of the pastors of this great church. I wonder how you might feel embattled or beleaguered these days. Does it feel like the world is battling you? Like the world is coming against you? Maybe specific people. Does it feel like you're beset by problems and issues that on certain days or weeks seem insurmountable? I wonder what distress you might feel. And of course, this looks different for all of us, but the simple reality that I want to set before us today is that we easily feel embattled by life's problems in this fallen and broken world. We easily feel embattled by life's problems in this fallen and broken world. And let's face it, right now, we are all facing this really awful reality. Just this past week, I was feeling so many ups and downs with the, the ups of the good news about vaccines, but the downs of how long it will take to distribute in the world and just the rising cases everywhere. I mean, just in the last week or so, we had in one day, six doctors in Kenya die from COVID-19. Since schools have had their phased reopening in Kenya, 13 school principals killed by this awful virus. Perhaps you feel beleaguered by mounting drama in the world with all kinds of political and social upheaval and drama everywhere. It could just be exhausting at best and really depressing at worst. Perhaps you even feel embattled in your relationship with God. And so it can make it really hard to trust Him. On, on top of all of these things, it can make it really hard to trust God. Sometimes it can feel like life is just laughing at us. There's just too many problems. And it seems that even in the midst of all these problems, they just seem insurmountable. And yet God is calling us to, to trust Him. He's calling His people to trust and see and understand that He is worthy of our trust. That childlike trust or faith in God is what He's always been calling His people to in this fallen and broken world. But let's be honest, sometimes it can feel like God is no match for our day-to-day -day problems. The challenge for the Jews of Obadiah's time was the same as it is for us now. The challenge to grow in our trust of God's sovereign care and His action on our behalf. Well, the people of Obadiah's world inhabited that space. And that was the call for them in light of a very specific way of being embattled. So today we're in the fourth part of a five-part series on the Minor Prophets. Today is the message of Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is an interesting book overall. For starters, it's the shortest book in the Bible, just 21 short verses, mostly poetry, that feels a bit obscure. And as one pastor says, Obadiah is the spleen of the Old Testament. We know it's there, but most of us are very hazy about its role in the body. In fact, I'm curious to know if any of you have ever heard a sermon on Obadiah. I would love if I could to see a show of hands. I doubt it's very many at all. Many sons are named after prophets, even minor prophets, but I've never met someone named Obadiah. Well, perhaps the only time you've ever come across this short little book in the Old Testament is in a read through the Bible in a year plan. And it's one of those that's easy to just scratch off your list and you may just read right through it quickly without even paying it much attention. So yeah, Obadiah doesn't get a lot of play. But church, it's a powerful little book. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will grow us, will use it to grow us in our trust of God as we consider the beauty of His sovereignty. If you've ever cared about injustice, oppression, human rights violations, Obadiah is a book for you. It shows us that God cares about these real-life situations. And though He may not act on our timeline, from our finite perspective, He will one day put all things right. 
Obadiah is one of those prophets that references a very specific story, a very specific history in Israel's history. And so in this case, it's the story of Jacob and Esau. In Genesis 25, we learn of Abraham's son, Isaac, and his wife, Rebekah, and the twins that she was about to give birth to. She's pregnant with these twins, Esau and Jacob. And they, as we see early on, are destined for a life of struggle against each other. And it's a struggle that begins in the womb. After they grow up, the first story that we hear is of the older one, the one who came out first, Esau, selling his birthright to his brother Jacob for a pot of stew. The story ends with the author telling us Esau despised his birthright. He despised what was coming to him as a blessing. He despised the blessing of God and instead valued satisfying his short-term appetite. Well, as you may know, Jacob is no saint in this saga, and he's quite a, a trickster. And later on, with the help of his mother, he steals his brother's blessing from his aging father, Isaac. Well, from then on, the conflict would remain, and the two brothers and the, the descendants of them, their family lines, would remain enemies, enemy peoples and tribes from then on. So this is the backdrop of Obadiah and why the prophet will use the term Edom and Esau interchangeably. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau, and you can see there in the map, in the yellow, that's where the, the tribe or the people of Edom were living. Well, centuries later, God rescued the Hebrew people, Jacob's descendants, out of slavery in Egypt to make their way up to the promised land. But on the way, their distant relatives, the Edomites, would not let them pass through the land. And so it made their journey much, much longer. Well, so then more centuries later, by the 6th century BC, when Obadiah is prophesying, they are sworn enemies. And now Obadiah proclaims God's judgment as part of the message. So with that background in mind, let's hear all of Obadiah in its entirety. Good morning, church. My name is Janet Onyango, and this morning I'm reading from the book of Obadiah, verses 1 to 21. The vision of Obadiah. Edom will be humbled. Thus says the Lord concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride, of your, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have driven you to the border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Edom's violence against Jacob, verse 10. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. 
The day of the Lord is near, verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return upon your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow, and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau a stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. The Kingdom of the Lord, verse 19. Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shepelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Separad shall possess the cities of the Negeb. Saviors shall go up Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Janet, for reading God's word for us. That is indeed the word of the Lord. Well, the first key part of the message that Obadiah gives God's people to bolster their trust in God's sovereignty is this. God is sovereign against proud nations. God is sovereign against proud nations. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. You see, the Edomites suffered from a pride of position. Obadiah is being quite literal here. They lived in this mountainous area, as you saw there in the map. It's where present-day Petra in the country of Jordan would be. It was this rocky terrain that had this natural superior position in the hills and the mountains of that area. And so they had this pride of position. They felt like they were invincible because of their fortress. But notice, it starts in the heart. Once again, in the Minor Prophets, this focus on the heart. Pride starts in the heart. And similar to the other prophets, pride is birthed in the heart. Maybe it doesn't feel like a nation is coming against you. Maybe it feels like perhaps real people are actual enemies. But I wonder, just knowing our own hearts and how our hearts can deceive us, how they can be deceitful above all things, to be careful to check how much might your pride play a role in any conflict that you're currently involved in? How has the pride of your heart deceived you? Or in the face of being embattled, of being beleaguered, beset by issues in life, how easy is it for you, sister or brother in Christ, how easy is it for you to rely on self-sufficiency, to seek self-sufficiency instead of trusting in the Lord? I wonder what that looks like for you. God also sovereignly judges Edom for a pride of aloofness. Look at verses 10 to 12. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Well, here Obadiah is alluding to the Babylonian conquest of 586 BC when they conquered Jerusalem. So imagine that you have twin brothers who live in this house together and thieves, robbers enter the house. And what they're interested in is the parents' room, the really valuable stuff, or the the china, the crystal. They're interested in finding the safe. But in the midst of all that chaos and drama of these thieves entering the house, one of the twin brothers 
takes advantage of that situation and he goes into his brother's room and robs his very own brother. You see, part of the strengthening of Judah's trust, Judah's trust in God was Obadiah's message of hope. The message of hope that comes in part because Edom would see God's justice. They would not get away with this. Well, I wonder how this talk of God's sovereignty against proud nations connects with you. Does it seem too lofty, too out there? Does it just seem too macro to talk of all these nations? Well, if so, the next insight that Obadiah gives God's people to grow in their trust of God is this. God is sovereign for his embattled people. God is sovereign for his embattled people. If you are a parent of especially young children, you know that when two siblings are having a conflict, if one of them really feels like the genuine victim, and there are times where it could be objectively true, right? That one child is the victim of another child's schemes or drama. Now, If you've ever experienced this, whether when you were a child or even now as a parent, that when a parent steps in and brings justice to what at that time for that little child feels like the biggest deal in the world. It's amazing how for that child, they they not only grow to see that, okay, there is something right with the world, but they grow in respect and admiration and love of that parent. And so, parents, even just a a side note to you, especially young parents, it's not only helpful for our kids to see that there can be justice in the world. Yeah, it's true they need to learn that the world isn't fair, and they will learn that. But when they can get a taste that some things can be put right, there can be justice in this world, not only does that help shape their view in a healthy way, but that action by you to to bring some justice to what to us as parents seems very trivial at the time but they grow in seeing how you reflect God to them to see that God is a God of justice to see that there is a character of God that can be reflected in their mother or father so we see in Obadiah that God is sovereign for his embattled people. And look at the Lord's actions. Here's just a list of some things that we see throughout this book. of Things that God will do. He will rise up against injustice and oppression. He will hold nations to account. Psalm 2 says the nations will rage and the peoples will plot, but the Lord laughs at them. The rulers, the despots, the tyrants will be held to account. So he will hold nations to account. He will bring down the lofty, the high, and the mighty. He will exact just vengeance. He will bring deliverance. He will bring restoration. He speaks and it will come to pass. He will provide an ultimate savior to bring the kingdom in its fullness. Church, we need to be careful not to confuse the kingdom with something else. Especially to confuse it with Christendom, this idea that came from the the Middle Ages, the Medieval Ages that we call the Dark Ages for good reason. When the church wedded itself to the state and vice versa. And even today, thousands of years later, a thousand years later, many Christians have this view that we need to somehow hold on to political and social power to protect ourselves and that somehow that will advance the gospel. But church... The church, the universal church, has always been strongest when it's a beleaguered people to depend on God, to say, God, we don't need to hitch ourselves to leaders, especially leaders that are vile and evil and have despicable character. And today across the world, Christians are hitching themselves to leaders, thinking that the means will justify the ends the end of somehow having political and social power to advance the kingdom, to advance Christianity. And so we sell out. And the church loses its reputation in so many ways across so many different situations. Now, 
Church, the kingdom is the kingdom of the mustard seed. Our God is the God of the mustard seed. And as we go out and proclaim the gospel and live it out, we don't need political and social power. Now, as individual Christians, yeah, go out there. Be part of of the political and social world to speak out, to speak out on behalf of justice and what you believe is right. And as a church, we will speak to some moral issues as we see it in God's word. But let's never confuse the kingdom of God with some worldly view of Christendom. You could go on a whole sermon for that, but I'll move along. So, the ends do not justify the means. Church, after all, we have an eternal Savior who laid down his life in humility. And so what Obadiah points forward to is this fulfillment in Christ. Our crucified Savior who experienced the boasting and the gloating of his enemies. Obadiah echoes Psalm 22, which is quoted in Jesus' passion narrative about his enemies boasting and gloating over him in his suffering. But he did not stand aloof. He did not stay in this place of glory, but he emptied himself of position and status And he entered this embattled world. And this cup of God's wrathful wrathful judgment and punishment that's alluded to there in verse 16, Jesus drank that cup down to the dregs. So in the face of life seeming like it's way too much and that we're way too embattled, there is a way to grow in our trust of God. We need to recognize and understand God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty against proud nations and God's sovereignty for his embattled people. If you feel beleaguered or beset by life's challenges to any degree, let me take these truths about God's sovereignty over and against the nations and God's sovereignty for his beleaguered people and have you consider with me how we can grow in trust for God's sovereign care and action in our lives. How do you grow in trust for anyone? Think about it. How do you grow in trust for anyone in your life, anyone in this world? Well, I think it's simple. You get to know them or you keep getting to know their heart and their character. You see or remember their record of faithfulness. Well, I think it's the same with God. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't already done that assignment I gave you to go on a define the relationship walk with God, a DTR, to go on this walk with God to say, God, how are we doing? How is our relationship? If so, if you haven't done that already, or if you want to take some time, if you've done it already, to sit and consider, to soak in truths about God's faithfulness. Well, if not, that time, whether on that walk or just sitting by yourself in the next day or week or so, that'd be the perfect time to reflect on this, to reflect on God's faithfulness to you, to reflect on His goodness in your life. Talk to Him about any tendency that you may have towards self-sufficiency instead of depending upon Him, and He will show you practically what that looks like for you. Well, Church Obadiah ends like this in verse 21. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That plural word, saviors, it could point to various rulers and leaders that would come along for God's people. But church, next week, Advent begins. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited. It feels like a bizarre Christmas season, but I'm really excited about it after the year that we've had. But next week, Advent begins. Advent, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what the angel told Mary? In the Gospel of Luke, the angel tells Mary that he, Jesus, will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Obadiah could not have fully known what he was pointing to when he used that word. But look at what the Holy Spirit reveals through the Apostle John to bring this to fulfillment for all of us. In Revelation chapter 11, 
It says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And if the song handles Messiah is in your head, you're not alone. And he shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Son, and Spirit, our Almighty God, we praise you that you shall reign as our great God forever and ever. We will be with you. One day you will bring final and full and ultimate justice. You will put all things right. And Lord, would you increase our hope in this, that as we struggle during this pandemic, in this particular week, even on this particular day, as we feel embattled or beleaguered in whatever way, remind us, Lord, that you are sovereign against proud nations, even against proud people. Lord, where there is pride in us, Would you root it out so that we can be freed up to love others well and to trust you more? Remind us of your sovereignty for your embattled people. Lord, that you are for us. And therefore, who could be against us? That we don't have to follow the the ways of this world to seek political and social power, especially in ways that would bring the church and your name into disrepute. God, forgive us for relying on ourselves. Lord, help us to trust in you. We need your Holy Spirit to bring transformation. Lord, I pray for those who, coming into this Christmas season, feel especially embattled. Lord, would you bring the hope of this Advent season? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Thank you.